It was the heart of darkness for corruption. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of hits going on, murders. One day the guy's killing somebody, and then the next day he's planning his son's graduation party. As far as a mob is concerned, the Chicago outfit stood above all others. It took at least three decades to wear them down. What happened to Chicago mob, the Chicago outfit? That's a good question. Once fertile subjects for movies and television, the Chicago Outfit had a roster of bosses with colorful nicknames. Big Tuna, Doves, Jackie the Lackey, The Hatchet, The Ant, Joey the Clown. But there was nothing amusing about their staggering body count. I mean, there was murder after murder after murder. Garros was slain in gangland style as he sat in the front seat of his Oldsmobile sedan. Two gunmen had fired eight shots into Garros' head and body. This will be a slight exaggeration, but there wasn't a week that went by that I don't think there was a body somewhere. The Hinsdale businessman was blown to smithereens when his Mercedes exploded as he was about to enter the Tri-State Tollway. It was a headline-grabbing way of life in Chicago, spanning generations, until it wasn't. What about your safety? Huh? That's a question you guys all got? In a city that attracts millions of tourists a year, Frank Calabrese Jr. is a popular guy. All right, so you know I went and seen the boss, and I pay him money every month, so we're okay. You guys believe that? <laughs> he leads tours through a chapter of Chicago history that's created a fascinating but unfortunate image of the city around the world. Chicago in those days had a horrible reputation. Um, you know, it was the heart of darkness for corruption um, and the mob. At one time, Chicago, in its heyday of the mob, which would have been in the late 60s, early 70s, into the mid-80s, was the most powerful organized crime family in the country. Calabrese was born into that family. He lived the mob life until he could take it no more. The handwriting was on the wall. A very, very powerful organization at one time, and they were slowly taken apart. In the 20th century, Chicago's population exploded. The nation's second largest city had more than three million residents. Many were new immigrants, easy prey for criminals. Anytime you have a large immigrant population, they are vulnerable to unscrupulous individuals because they don't know the language that much, they don't know the customs. They're trying to get ahead legitimately. They're looking for help. Help came from mobsters like Johnny Torrio and a New York transplant named Al Capone. Scarface and the Chicago Outfit were putting people to work in an assortment of illegal activities, bootlegging, gambling, extortion, and prostitution. Their successors would also become famous. Accardo's stature among crime syndicate figures dwarfed other mob leaders, including Sam Giancana. Over the decades, their influence and domination spread far beyond Chicago. There were times at which the Chicago mob controlled a more significant portion of the labor movement in the United States than any mob family even came close to it. If Chicago outfit guys wanted to pad their income, local politicians were all too willing to set them up with city jobs. The work was hardly demanding. You lived like a king. You go to work if you were tied in anywhere. Nobody bothered you. Half the times you didn't even have to go to work. You know, you go in, punch out, I'm going to get something to eat. And it was just a, a great life, a great life. Not such a great life if you were an innocent victim of the mob's extortion. Pay what they called a street tax or else. Believe me, I promise you, I'll break every bone in your body before I go to jail. They blew up a cleaners and a dry cleaners and they were very vulnerable to a shakedown. They set businesses on fire, they blew them up, they killed people. It was hard to do business um, if you weren't paying off the mob. And in Chicago, the mob had some judges and cops in their pocket. Judges and cops who shielded gangsters from criminal prosecution. There were very high-ranking Chicago police officers. We convicted the chief of detectives of running a mob-protected uh, burglary crew, robbery crew. The Chicago outfit appeared invincible. Who are you? You're Channel 2? Get out of here, Channel 2. Until law enforcement pulled out all the stops with an assist 
from Father Time. Uh, I was an FBI agent for 22 years. Tom Bourgeois was a member of an aggressive federal and local law enforcement task force. Cops, FBI, and IRS agents, and prosecutors who put the mob in their crosshairs. That was, it was a, a concerted effort, but as we opened up the Chicago FBI toolbox, we found a lot of stuff that we could use in order to take on the mob, and we used it all. September 4th, talking to Tony DiDino. Could be a wiretap, could very well be a microphone in a certain place, could be cameras. We utilized certainly a lot of surveillance in regards to the mobsters. We used undercover techniques in order to get closer to these people. Insiders trapped by the electronic evidence started to flip moved by ominous warnings from prosecutors. You're going to go to jail forever. Either you're going to go to jail forever or we know that somebody's going to kill you. Can you yeah. think of a time when you told somebody you thought they were going to be killed and they didn't yeah. cooperate and they yeah. ended up killed? Yes. Well, give me, tell uh, us about I, I don't think I can. Okay. I, I don't think I should. William Dauber lived in the south suburbs. He was employed by the outfit. He was a ruthless hitman. But the government was also on Mr. Dauber's rear end. And they were leaning on him pretty heavily, and he was beginning to cooperate. The Daubers were providing a degree of evidence. They were appearing in a courthouse. They were out there in order to meet with some prosecutors. Within five or six minutes after he left that Will County Courthouse, he was assassinated along with his wife, Charlotte. They used a van, pulled open the van door, and then shotgunned and shot into the car that had the daubers in it and murdered them both. This was a brutal, brutal murder. But not all witnesses would be knocked off, and the law enforcement task force scored some big wins. One by one, they sent Chicago mobsters to prison. For him. No comment. Nine of the 20 defendants charged in the 42 count indictment were released on. A lot of the old time mobsters got really significant sentence. Many of them died in prison or are going to die in prison. Um, that has a, a profound effect on successive generations. Their power and their reach has diminished significantly. Further diminished by an outfit attorney, Bob Cooley. I was involved in a lot of fixes in a lot of uh, illegal activities that went on. I represented a lot of the mobsters in Chicago. One day, Cooley walked into my office and said, I can't handle it anymore. Cooley agreed to wear a wire and exposed corruption in the Cook County court system. In some cases, judges took bribes to make serious charges against mobsters disappear. It was called Operation Greylord. Greylord, the degree of judicial corruption really blew me away. Nearly 100 people were convicted. The mob was imploding. Never more clear than when Frank Calabrese Jr. turned against his father, Frank Calabrese Sr. He did a lot of heavy work. Heavy work meant hurting people, killing people, blowing things up, intimidating people. He was also the largest loan shark in the whole city. He himself was involved in no less than 15 murders, had specific knowledge of more than another 23. Frank's technique was to get the guy someplace, he would strangle him with a rope, and after he had used the rope on him, he would then slit their throats. Frank Jr. had followed his father into the mob. In his 40s, he wanted out. I actually thought about killing him at one point when I got out. But then I decided against that. I didn't think it was the right thing to do. Instead, he made a deal with the FBI. So I contacted them, said I wear a wire. Frank Calabrese Jr. was the main witness in the landmark FBI investigation called Family Secrets. And what I did was I used my Uncle Nick, because my dad always taught me, pits one person against another, get somebody angry, and they'll talk. And I pitted my Uncle Nick against my dad to get my dad to talk. And he did. And he did. And this was hard every day for me. Even when I was cooperating in prison, I'd go back to my cell, tears would be in my eyes. And I always was looking for, am I doing something wrong? Am I being a bad son? It helped authorities solve nearly 20 mob murders going back to 1970. Frank Calabrese Sr. was sentenced to life in prison. Jail, gangland hits, constant government surveillance. For many children of Chicago mobsters, that life was no longer appealing. 
recruiting became hard over the years. My father had me recruit guys, and I remember some guys talking to them, and they just didn't want to do that way of life. They seen it too on the street, it was changing. I think we were right. I think focusing on the older bosses and making it really unattractive to replace them actually wore them down to the point at which they did not have the political power. The mob started going downhill after the case in Kansas City, which was in 85, 86, all on trial for skimming money from Las Vegas casinos. That broke the back of the Chicago mob. That was a body blow to the mob. It doesn't mean that they stopped being crooks and all ran off to become Boy Scouts. It's just not gonna happen. However, their power and their reach has diminished significantly, and that is something to be said. I just want to know who killed Ronnie Jarrett. We don't know. <laughs> who do you think it was? I don't have any idea. I know it was the mob. So I can tell you who killed Jimmy Hoffa. No, ah. <laughs> <laughs>